Hello again, this is Dr. Mike Couch and I would like to welcome you to part two of the three-part webcast, The Answer, True Forehanded Dentistry. In part one, we identified significant problems threatening the health and well-being of the dentist and dental team. Now we address those problems with the answers. So let's get started. First as a review of part one, the building blocks of true forehanded dentistry are a properly positioned team and patient, full utilization of the assistant, workflow and workspace organized around functional zones of activity, work simplification built on motion economy. The principles and actions summarized in these building blocks are illustrated in the rest of this webcast. To put things into perspective, let's take a look at an overview. Dentistry plays a major role in this country's healthcare industry. Concern for productivity, decreased stress, consumer protection, and patient comfort require that dentistry be practiced as a team using basic ergonomic concepts. Ergonomics is the study of the physical relationship between people and their environment. Any dental professional will tell you that sitting at chair side all day is very uncomfortable and stressful. Sitting incorrectly and using instruments inappropriately all day is even worse. The clinical dynamics of true forehanded dentistry is the process where a skilled operator and assistant work together to perform clinical tasks in a safe, stress-free environment. Unlike other methods, this concept improves productivity and decreases stress on the patient and operating team. The principles of forehanded dentistry require that the patient be placed in the supine position the operating team be seated comfortably in ergonomically designed equipment. The dentist must assign all legally delegable duties to qualified auxiliaries based on each state's guidelines. Patient treatment has been planned in advance in a logical sequence. Motion economy is practiced. Preset trays are utilized and standardized infection control procedures are implemented. Genuine ergonomics are best achieved when true forehanded fundamentals of motion economy are practiced and the treatment area is designed and equipped to optimize the zones of activity. Motion economy refers to the way energy can be conserved and strain on the body reduced by refining specific motions. Motion can be classified into five categories according to the length of the motion. Class one is a fingers only movement such as picking up a small cotton pellet. Class two is a fingers and wrist motion as used when transferring an instrument to the operator. Class three includes the fingers, wrist, and elbow as when reaching for a handpiece. Class four requires movement of the entire arm and shoulder as when reaching into the mobile cabinet. Class five requires the entire torso to be moved as when turning to activate the electrosurgery unit. The latter two motion classifications, four and five, are the most strenuous and eliminating these will conserve energy and reduce stress. The principles of motion economy require that you minimize the number of instruments to be used for a procedure. Position the instruments on a tray in the sequence that they will be used whenever possible. Position instruments, materials, and equipment in advance whenever possible. Place the patient in a supine position. Place instruments and materials on a mobile cabinet as close to the patient as possible. Provide work areas that are one to two inches lower than the elbow. Use operating stools that provide good body support. Minimize the number of eye movements. Reduce the length and number of motions. Use body motions that require the least amount of time and movement. Use smooth, continuous motions and avoid distracting zigzag movements. The final concept refers to the chair side zones of activity. All treatment revolves around the patient's mouth. The area around the mouth is divided into four zones of activity, operator zone, assistant zone, transfer zone, and static zone. The operator zone extends from seven to 12 o'clock for a right-handed operator and from 12 to 4 o'clock for a left-handed operator. The operator is able to move about within the zone of activity to improve visibility. For instance, the 12 o'clock position would allow the right-handed operator
to work on the labial surface of the maxillary anterior teeth and use direct vision. The operator could use direct vision by moving to the 7 or 8 o'clock position when working on the occlusal surface of mandibular right posterior teeth. The assistance zone is from 2 to 4 o'clock for a right-handed operator and 8 to 10 o'clock for a left-handed operator. This area is the assistance domain. Nothing in this area should interfere with the assistance access to instruments on the mobile cart or to the handpieces on the dental unit. The movable top of the mobile cart is brought into the assistance zone over the lap on the upper edge of the arc and the dental handpieces from a transthorax unit extend into the zone at the lower edge of the arc. The transfer zone is the area around or below the patient's mouth where instrument transfer occurs. The transfer zone extends from 5 to 8 o'clock for a right-handed operator or 4 to 7 o'clock for the left-handed person. This area should be used only for transfer of instruments and materials to and from the patient's mouth. Because the transfer zone is specifically designated for instrument transfer, the operator will be able to keep hands and eyes on the field of operation without wondering from which direction the next instrument will come. The static zone is the zone of least activity. It extends from 12 to 2 o'clock when working with a right-handed operator or 10 to 12 o'clock for a left-handed operator. Instruments or equipment that are used infrequently, such as a portable curing light or blood pressure equipment, and the assistance cart when not in use, may be stored in this area. Care should be taken by both members of the team to avoid interfering with the activities of the other person within the designated zones. The operator should not interfere with the assistance domain, the preset tray or the instruments on the mobile cabinet. The assistant, likewise, should not interfere with the operator's vision or operative sight. To enter into the other person's zone of activity interferes with the smooth flow of activity and will likely require unnecessary movement, interference with the procedure, and the operator's refocusing on the site. As we described in Part 1, some great resources are available for more detailed information. The Four-Handed Dentistry Manual from the UAB School of Dentistry. Dr. Harold Kilpatrick's Work Simplification in Dental Practice. Dr. Joe Chastine's Four-Handed Dentistry in Clinical Practice, and Betty Finkbeiner's great book, Four-Handed Dentistry. In closing, being in great physical shape and using stretching, yoga, and other flexibility exercises can help your physical health. Creating a process and environment that enables true four-handed dentistry can in fact improve health, lower stress, and increase productivity. It is important to eliminate as many obstacles and challenges as possible. Once again, we thank you for your time and invite you to join us for Part 3, Best in Class Ergonomic Solutions, on our mission to improve the health and well-being of the dental team. If we can answer any questions you may have, please email me your question at michael.couch at caringquest.com. Additionally, if you email us, we will forward links to key resources.